And uh, I guess without further ado, let's welcome uh, Justin here to talk about threat modeling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Justin Goodhart. I'm from uh, Olympia, Washington, part of uh, the Only Mega group here, um, hanging out, helping out. And um, I'm here to talk about threat modeling and try not to do feedback. So if I lean forward. Um, I started out with uh, doing development work for about 13 years. And then uh, at one point, they shifted and pulled me over into the security team. And so I got a chance to start trying to help developers write more secure code, uh, better quality code. And over the years, I've been able to help out with threat modeling, been able to help out with uh, secure code, static code analysis, um, different talks, and pretty much just trying to be um, a good member of the community. How many folks have done threat modeling before? Show of hands. Nice. Those who didn't raise their hand, uh, I could probably guarantee that you have done some form of threat modeling. Uh, a good example is with traffic, uh, driving around, uh, obeying the uh, speed limit signs, doing maintenance on your car, um, being able to keep an eye out for the drivers around you, especially those who are driving erratically or who are on their phone while shaving and putting on makeup. So um, what you're doing is you're putting in different controls to try to reduce the threats that could go against you. So obeying the speed limit signs, keeping your distance from the car in front of you, making sure your uh, vehicle has been properly maintained so it doesn't break down on the side of the road. Those kind of things is what we are trying to encourage the developers in doing when they're building applications and when they're taking a look at uh, implementing new systems. We want them to see what kind of threats are there see what kind of things to avoid, see what they could put in place in order to try to reduce the risk to the application. I missed this slide. There it is. So starting out, I was going to talk about application threat modeling, and then I have a couple of slides on network threat modeling as well, kind of a new area I'm diving into. Um, threat modeling is where I have most of my experience, though. So. so application threat modeling, is approach for analyzing the security of application or system. So a good opportunity in order to be able to take a look at uh, how it's uh, documented, how, how it's built, how you have put in the different mitigations in place. And um, it also helps with the developers to get a chance in order to work with the security team um, in order to learn more and do cross collaboration because there's things developers have figured out to make things better that could help security, and then there's areas where security gets a chance to collaborate with the developers to help their code and their systems be more secure. So the process, uh, threat modeling process is pretty much breaking down the system. And then what you do is you determine what the threats are, and then you go through and you identify the countermeasures, the mitigations or controls you can put in place to reduce the risk, potentially also eliminating risk. Um, usually that means getting rid of the feature. but. Uh, most of the time, uh, what we do with application threat modeling is we start with the data flow diagram, a good conceptual diagram of the system using some simple uh, shapes. Um, the different shapes are external entity, so a different system or uh, potentially like someone, another company systems or another internal system that you're using or interfacing with, maybe even a third party service. Um, you have a process. This is um, where the work is actually done in the system. So a function could be a web service. You can look at like the application itself as its own process. Uh, the data flow, so where the data is going back and forth, and that's what you're trying to focus on. Um, and then the data store, where the data lands, where the file shares are, or your data store, like your database, um, maybe a flat file that you're storing somewhere with some data. And then trust boundaries is something a little bit different from the traditional data flow diagrams that threat models uh, use, and that shows going from one security context to another. So like um, a good example, on a web server, you have different uh, rights that you're running as than you would if you're connecting from a browser. Uh, or the settings that you have on a database is gonna be different than your web server. So you have different contexts that you're transferring from, and so we wanna show those lines in order to show when you're going from one context to another. A good example of a data, uh, one of the diagrams for a threat model is um, just one of the canned ones I found online from Microsoft. 
And uh, this one shows a user browser. Uh, the user's coming in through a user interface service. Uh, goes over to a user profile service that has its own data store. And it also incorporates in a newsfeed service that also has its own backend data store, but also can push out RSS feeds to the internet. What we do is we start out with the diagram here, and we sit down and we label each and every interaction going from one uh, process to the data flow, or from the data flow across the trust boundary, or going into another data store. And we want to make sure and stuff that we could actually reference that one pinpoint. And this was kind of a sloppy. Normally the numbers are much better, and you break it down um, more detail. But this was kind of overlaying. Then once you have your interactions on the uh, diagram, you go ahead and you sit down and you show at each one of those uh, steps where it crosses over from uh, across trust boundaries, across processes, and you identify the stride. Stride is a, a different threat categories, um, but each one has each of the different processes, external interactors, data stores, et cetera, have a different potential threat area. Um, let me go into that a little bit. So stride is spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And we'll see if we go back one. Probably should shift these slides around so that I go through stride before talking about the matrix. So old school, what we do is we sit down with this matrix and we break down uh, after we've identified all the different uh, elements on the diagram and we'd figure out what threats were there. And so we sit down and we go, okay, we're going from this point to that point. And we'd sit down and go, okay, there's spoofing and there is repudiation. And then we move on to the next one. And so it's kind of a manual process using this matrix. Later on, I'll show you a tool that uh, Microsoft provides for free that uh, helps determine the threats automatically, make it a little bit easier. So spoofing is trying to pretend that you're someone or that you're something that you're not. So a good example is if I was to go up and say that I'm Bill Gates, I'd have to prove it. And usually we do that through some sort of factor authentication, um, sometimes multi-factor, sometimes single factor, and you're trying to prove that identity. Well, sometimes you're interfacing with another service, some third party. Um, that third party, you want to be able to prove that that really is who you're talking to. And so you're trying to reduce the potential of um, an attacker or someone or maybe even a mistake, a misconfiguration and talking to someone that you're not supposed to be talking to or someone who's pretending to be someone that they're not. Tampering. This is where you're changing the data either across the wire or at rest or you're editing it when you're not authorized to do so. So uh, being able to capture it across the wire, inject something, um, also potentially uh, compromising the files on the uh, network share, something like that. Repudiation is basically a legal term for being able to prove that something happened. Um, usually we do this through, uh, mitigate it through logs in order to prove, um, usually also through third party. A good example, um, when you're buying stock and you go in there and you say, okay, the stock's coming down, it's about $15 a share, and you go ahead and you buy 100 shares but then you see it drop another $5. So you call up the company and you say, hey, I didn't buy it at $15, I really bought it at 10. Well, in order to be able to reduce the, someone trying to pull a scam or something over, they have a trusted third party that timestamps the interaction, how much it cost, the time, and you could prove that when you bought it, you really bought it at $15 a share. That's a good example too. Also, uh, the checks in the mail. So you call up the, or the, Collectors call you, and you're talking to them on the phone, and you say, well, the check's in the mail. We'll wait for them to prove that the check was in the mail on that particular day. The post office will stamp the envelopes that are going through the post office with their own timestamp. And they're a third party that doesn't care if you pay your bill on time or not. And so that works for non-repudiation. Another good kind of fun example. Information disclosure is very similar to tampering, except this time is unauthorized viewing of the data. So you've been able to gain access to a file, you've been able to see what's going across the wire that when you're not supposed to. Now this has uh, also a lot when you're getting into confidential data that uh, a lot of folks are not authorized to see. Denial of service is always fun. This is where 
being able to prevent something from running, being able to prevent someone from getting to your service, being able to prevent it from someone getting to your website. Um, denial of service also has fun stuff with the distributed DDoS attacks or what happened last night, I guess, with the wireless where it conveniently went down for a little while. Elevation of privilege, and this is where you can inject something in in order to be able to get more rights than you were authorized to have. So um, some folks do this through um, probably SQL injection, cross-site scripting, be able to gain access to different areas, or be able to change something they're not supposed to be able to change, or to try to change the context that they're running as in order to be able to have more rights, admin rights, other rights. Uh, back uh, about 2003, I think it was, the Trustworthy Computing Initiative that Bill Gates put out with a simple memo. Uh, they started working on being able to show different ways of identifying a scale for the risk of the system. And they used an acronym called DREAD. And it stands for Damage Repudi uh, Re Reproducibility, I could say it, Exploitability, uh, Affected Users, and Discoverability. And the whole goal was, is you sit there with a big room of folks, and you go down each one of these, giving it a scale of one to five. And so you could sit there, and you could debate over, is it really a three? Is it a four? Who, who, who wins? And uh, what ends up happening is, is you end up going through and identifying what the, the risk score is for that particular threat. And lessons learned, they ended up shifting it because there was too many folks fighting over the different scales to be able to go for a high, medium, low. So if you sit down in a group and someone goes, well, I think this is going to be really bad because it will impact us, it will affect 10,000 users, we're going to set it as high. And it's a lot easier to sell a high, medium, low than it is to go through each of these and have uh, a D of five and a R of one and a th uh, E of three and what does that mean kind of thing. So high, medium, low works much better when you're going through threat models. Then you go in and you start addressing each of the, th well, kind of bring it back, make sure that what's going on in my head you guys are actually understanding too. So. You've gone through, you've documented a system, you created a conceptual diagram, you've now marked each of the interactions, you've gone through and you've determined what kind of uh, threats are uh, happening to each of those interactions, and you've gone through and you've identified the risk of that particular threat. Now it's time to mitigate it. So there's uh, four main ways of mitigating threats, and it kind of, it's very similar to dealing with uh, risk. And you can mitigate the threat by adding in a control some way of being able to reduce the potential of that threat being exploited. You can eliminate the threat, which usually means you're getting rid of that feature, you're getting rid of that system. Um, sometimes program folks will come up to you and say, we really need to have this system in order to track this data. And then they just want to be able to put it into a Microsoft Access file, put it on the network share, and think that it's going to be safe. Or even better, someone in the office, uh, admin assistant, knows how to build uh, access forms, and they lock it down with a password. But they keep forgetting that you can just hold on the shift key, open up the access file, and bypass everything. So a little, the risk is there. So sometimes the better bet is to either get rid of that particular data store and say maybe there's a better way, or be able to transfer it over, like the next one, where you shift it over to another system, or you add an extra insurance in order to be able to deal with the risk or you deal with a third-party tool, trying to transfer that particular threat over somewhere else. And then there's always accepting the risk. And accepting the risk could be very dangerous. Folks are usually um, quicker to accept the risk of a, system, uh, a threat or of a bad system than they are to actually address it because they think it's going to take more time, more energy, a lot more fighting just to do it right. And so managers usually will just blindly accept. The trick there is to make sure you document it, make sure they understand what the risk is, and make sure that they understand what could happen if it goes wrong. And even better is when you could get the development team to come back later and note out how they would fix it if they were told to go fix it in the event of a breach or some sort of incident. But another kind of thing I picked up in one of my studies, um, sometimes worry is a sign that the risk hasn't been fully accepted or that risk acceptance was in, uh, appropriate. So you start going down the path, uh, they've already said we're gonna accept the risk, 
and then now the manager is a little worried about it or the dev team manager or someone else, the release manager, and they start to question whether or not that uh, risk is worth it, you should probably try to circle back around and reevaluate to see if there should be some other control in place or what you could do in order to be able to reduce that risk. So if you decide to go ahead and mitigate, there's uh, two main ways and stuff that uh, you can mitigate a threat. Design the security control that will protect it. And that's where you go through the different common mitigations like um, SQL injection threats. SQL injection threat, you use parameterized queries, your threat's gone. You make sure uh, you could use um, third-party tools like ND, uh, the NAD framework, which does parameterized queries behind the scenes. You can, in some cases, when you're doing more of the dynamic script, um, incorporate something like uh, sanitization and also input validation, but the best bet is to use like parameterized queries. And you put in that control of using parameterized queries, that threat goes away. Um, identify uh, that we are accepting the risk, and this is the second option. And this one I also kind of note, um, it's really good to document it, and also what you would do if it was exploited. Because that uh, having that list there, it helps you reduce the time after you've identified that there's been an incident before you could have a fix in place or a hot fix in place. Another good thing uh, when you're going through threat modeling with a team is to sit down with them and say, what are some of the common ones that we have? And as you start going through the threat models, start making a list of the different threats and how you would, um, how you mitigated it in that particular project. This list uh, eventually builds up into a nice library, a reference library you could refer back to. How did we fix it in the other project? What did we do last project or last year? And you can start seeing, okay, we saw this again. How did we fix it before? This is a real quick, easy way. Or how can we make it better and circle back and fix the application from last year? And so you get a chance in order to use this as a reference library, but it also builds up the team because as you go through it more often, they have a point of reference. They can study up on it. We have lessons learned. And then uh, another good thing to do is to look out at the different uh, articles and blogs and different feeds that come in to talk about security related issues because that Brent builds an awareness with your dev team, uh, security team as well. Being able to know what's out there, what kind of events are happening, what kind of threats are on the horizon, what are folks finding with the new technology that's coming out. And what it does is it helps build that team up with their understanding, and the better the understanding, the more they can collaborate when they come across a particular threat in the system that they haven't dealt with before. So an iterative approach. So just when you think it's over, you get to go through it again. Uh, in my, my organization, um, a lot of the developers, they'll build the threat model, and then they walk away from it, and then they go build something else that doesn't exactly follow the threat model. And that's a very bad approach. So I'm constantly trying to get them back in the room when things are changing to reevaluate how they've addressed that threat, what the system looks like, maybe even recreate the threat model after the fact in order to make sure it's more accurate, and then help identify if there are any, if there are any threats that we did not mitigate or we didn't know were there. And so uh, practice makes perfect, and it really pays off. And so as you get a chance to go through a few, it also builds up more confidence with your dev team because they've gone through it a few times. They're more familiar with it. They get faster at going through the threats. And uh, this is a diagram I pulled for more of an agile process. But uh, the idea is that you have that requirement, that vision that you want to build. It comes in, you model it, create the conceptual diagram. You go ahead and you identify the threats. You figure out the controls that you're going to put in, and that's where you enumerate through the threats. And then you go ahead and you build out your mitigations and then you do a validation step. And you could use different tools for the validation step, like uh, static code analysis, peer review, so really good. Um, you also have the chance to pull Poland security team if you have one, in order to take a look at the code, at the system, helping them with the validation. Quality assurance testers are really good uh, allies to have when you're dealing with the validation step too, because they could find functional bugs that would also result in a security bug. Because if it's not working right, Maybe it could be exploited. And so some essential questions that we want to ask while we're um, going through the threat modeling process. What are you building? What does it look like? What is it using? What kind of platforms? 
what could go wrong with it once it's built? Are we going to deploy it out to the wild and just let it go, or do we have a plan to maintain it? What should you do about those things uh, that can go wrong? So um, if you know that there's going to be the potential that uh, your internal server that's underneath someone's desk could go down, maybe you should move it to one of the servers in the data center or go to the cloud, which is a fun buzzword. And then you go ahead and ask the question of, did we do a decent job of the analysis? When we're going through this threat modeling process, have that retro uh, retrospection of how it went, uh, how did we communicate as a team, how did we address the issues, were there one areas that we need to improve in? Do we need better uh, models? Do we need to do a better job of uh, working together across the different teams? And get a chance in order to figure out how to make it smoother, quicker, and uh, easier. When we're going through that, I kind of explained the more of a manual process of doing the diagramming. Uh, Microsoft, I mentioned earlier, and a few other companies have some tools that make it a lot easier so that you could just do the diagramming and then it helps you with identifying the threats and then also documenting how you're mitigating. The Microsoft uh, Threat Modeling Tool 2016, which they also now have a prototype, a preview for their Azure version of a threat modeling tool to help out when you're doing Azure type systems. Uh, this one is free and it, uh, it works a lot like a Visio stencils. You just do the drawing of your system and then it determines the threats for you and you can just go down and you show how you're gonna uh, address those. There's another one called Threat Modeler. Threat Modeler has a cost to it, but uh, they have three different editions uh, to use. You have standard edition where you get a chance to draw everything out, more of a single use, a uh, single machine license. You have a DevOps edition, which is supposed to help with uh, the devs get a chance to connect, they do their role, security folks connect and do their role, and you get a chance to kind of track it through your life cycle. And then the enterprise edition uh, is for more of the distributed, keeping track of multiple systems, um, multiple different projects. And then some other possible threat modeling tools that you can look up, um, the SecureCAD, uh, Iris Risk, which some folks say is uh, really, I haven't gotten a chance to dive into it, but I've heard good things about. Uh, SD Elements uh, by Security Compass. So that was the application side. Um, I also want to note um, on the uh, website for TorCamp, I also have two other resources, uh, a guide that talks about the different uh, types of threats for the stride threats, and then a list of their mitigations, the common ones, to use as a guide in order to help with the conversation. And then also I have a uh, networking resource guide in order to help with some of the questions that you want to ask to that. So to kind of shift gears a little bit from the application side, and you're going to see my novice work on the network threat modeling side. So uh, a lot of research into trying to find uh, someone else's work because plagiarism is cool. And so uh, I found a really good presentation that talked about documenting, segmenting, and then restricting is the kind of the roadmap for how do you address network threat modeling. The concept is uh, keeping your documentation up to date on your network map, how the systems are configured, so that you could use it as a reference guide in order to make sure that things are right, because that helps with the validation step uh, when you can circle back later. Um, the segmentation, in order to be able to make it so that uh, it's not one big flat network, that everyone can't talk to everyone, unless you have other controls in place like the certificates and there's some new stuff that's going on now where you don't even have to worry about firewalls and I don't know. I saw some stuff at the RSA conference that was pretty out there. But uh, with the segmentation, you don't want to be able to have something that has like confidential systems or if you have secret or top secret type stuff, being able to be on the same network with all the uh, public information. You want to be able to separate those out so that uh, someone who gains access to the public systems can't necessarily gain access to your more sensitive networks. And then restrict. And instead of going with the defaults for your routers and switches, instead of going with the defaults for your servers, being able to configure and lock them down so that folks only have access to what they're, they need to to get the job done and only to the areas and stuff that they're supposed to be able to get access to. Some additional considerations. So how many different devices? Are you talking about a home network or are you talking about an enterprise with 19,000 plus employees with different uh, servers and devices across the whole? How many different versions of firmware are you having to deal with? If you have five different router types, but they're all dispersed across, and they all have different firmwares, 
is there maybe a chance there in order to get them all on the same firmware? Um, are you using the recommended versions? In some cases, um, folks in different organizations, um, personal experience, uh, forgot to keep the routers uh, up to date on the latest firmware. And so a couple of years goes by and you find this and it's a firestorm in order to go through and try to get everyone up to speed, get it uh, all the firmware at the right level. And then uh, do you have a good change management process in place? Being able to keep track of the different versions, the changes, um, where they're at, and then also you don't want any hidden surprises. So one day, all of a sudden, everything's available through Shodan and you're scrambling to figure out why and there's been no changes, at least nothing in your logs. And then all of a sudden, you call up one, uh, the group that works on it and we're actually, they're now off the internet again. So it's kind of weird when that happens magically without any logs or any change or any uh, record that, that they made any changes on the network or firewalls. And so it's kind of scary because you never know when something might just pop up. Um, another option, um, I've seen some examples where folks have taken a network diagram for their network um, threat modeling and they just converted it over to a data flow diagram and then used the existing tools that they had in place, but they used it more with the stride and the dread. And some folks say that that is challenging because application processes aren't exactly the same as the network. So. So questions? We're good. Please. How much time do developers end up investing in threat modeling for say just some like standard feature that they're gonna add? Very good question. Uh, the question was is how long uh, how much time do a developer spend when they're um, on threat modeling when they're building a new feature? And um, it depends on how hostile they are. Um, some groups haven't done or haven't been forced to do a lot of threat modeling before and so they'll drag their feet and they'll make it uh, seem like it's the worst idea in the world uh, just to convince management that they shouldn't do threat modeling in the first place it does happen um, but I've have um, worked with multiple teams now and stuff where we could get a new threat model knocked out in about an hour and sitting down and just get a room together make it a team sport uh, pull in the folks that are working, like the BA, so they can answer some questions. Pull in, uh, if you're dealing with like databases, operations stuff, the server configurations, pull the operations folks into the room. Sit down and you just spend that hour going through and uh, knock out the threats, make sure it's diagrammed accurately, and then run with it. Yeah. <laughs> It'll make it on there. Very good. Between application uh, data flow diagrams and network mm -hmm. data flow diagrams, uh, do you have like different requirements or different uh, ways of doing them? There are, uh, the question was um, between application diagrams and network diagrams, um, the differences. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so with the application diagram, you're primarily focusing on the data. Where is it going in the system? With the network, um, you're looking at um, the different IP ranges, your different firewall rules, um, where things could diverse back and forth, what kind of traffic you're looking at, um, do you have quality of uh, service in, uh, configured? So maybe streaming a video goes different than um, someone trying to send an email. But uh, usually what you end up with is um, there's the logical network diagrams where you could show um, the IP addresses going from one router to a switch or uh, traversing the whole network. And then you also have uh, some folks that will do their whiteboard network diagrams, which look like clouds with lines and some little brick walls. And so it kind of varies there um, on the network side. But usually what you want to do is you want to have something that's accurate. So make sure that they validate the diagram and then you can just sit down and say, okay, do we have the right versions of the firmware? Do we have it locked down properly? Do we have the right firewall rules in place? Have we worked with the firewall team in order to make sure that the configurations are there or is it set to any any, which some folks still do. But um, yeah, you remember? I remember. Um, how much do you see this impacting the rising cyber insurance world? <laughs> yeah, uh, the question was about uh, how we see the threat modeling impacting the cyber insurance world. And um, it, the cyber insurance world is dealing more with the risk management than the threat management of the applications, but it still comes into play because some folks will say uh, that they'll just go ahead and 
pay a little bit more for the insurance or a third party through an SLA um, will uh, insist that they have their uh, insurance uh, uh, high enough in order to be able to cover the expenses of the system or potential damages or how it would take in order to get it up in the in a, in a, uh, natural, a natural emergency or uh, some sort of attack. Yeah. Please. The first part again, real quick. Um, audit compliance. Audit compliance. So, kind of breaking that. So, the difference. I think the question was. Right. So kind of uh, the different, what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So when you're dealing with uh, how much time do you put towards auditing and compliance, how much time do you put towards training and best practices, how much time do you put towards doing threat modeling? Is that kind of a summary? Good. Uh, so when you're dealing, having those learning opportunities where you're saying that we're just not making you do this because we hate you, we're doing this because we love you and we want you to grow. Which threat modeling sometimes gets that way. Um, so most of the time, making sure to reiterate, making sure to be open when they are hostile. So uh, you go into a dev team and they're, uh, first thing you wanna let them know when you're the first time they have to go through a threat model is say that you're here to help, you're here in order to make it easier that it's, it's going to be a team sport, but then you want to make sure and stuff that uh, kind of try to carry them at the beginning, go to the extra mile, be there for questions, be there for uh, walking them through it, but then also be able to point them to some good resources they can find on their own, so the best practices and training side. Um, and then at the same time, being able to just actually tell them, you're going to be audited later, at some point you're going to be audited, and this will help make it so that those are easier so you don't have to worry about that as much. Um, that helps with the app dev managers too because app dev managers don't like dealing with audits. Um, the downside though, when you're talking about threat modeling, sometimes they don't see the importance of it. Sometimes they're hostile towards it or they're resistant. And so getting a chance in order to try to make sure that their managers are involved and that they understand that there's a, um, a value added to the team. And that's where it also helps with uh, documenting the systems because if they create a threat model in the data flow diagram and you say that that's good enough for their application diagram, it helps them go, wait, I don't have to create more documents. I could just create that and then check it in with the code and I'm done. Please. And your team will get very hot, so if you add this as that extra hurdle at the end before they can ship to the end product. That's a very good point. So sooner the, the development life cycle, the better. Um, a good example, uh, we had a privacy office come down with their own system. And so the developers were screwing in order to look good to the privacy officer. And they sat down and they, they finally listened to me. I'm like, do it at the very beginning before you write up the system, because far too often they start coding. They would have something in, in QA. They'd possibly have something in production. And then they'd go, wait a minute, we're supposed to do a threat model on this, weren't we? It happens. Um, and so as soon as they know what they're uh, kind of a concept of what they want to build, do the threat model right there at the very beginning. And it's going to be much easier on them. It's going to be much easier on everyone because it's no longer now a stopgap. It's no longer a hurdle that they have to jump through. It's now just part of, it's like a guide. It helps them get a better picture of what they're going to be building, how they're going to be coding it. And so usually they actually like the threat model at that stage opposed to being resistant to it. So yeah, please. Just kind of further on that subject, um, do, do you, 
in your mind, should you be revisiting the threat model whenever you get a scope change? Um, should you have a cadence to reevaluate your threat model throughout the life cycle, or should like how, how would you look at that? The way I explain it at work, um, you have your conceptual diagram of your system. And then different features could be added on without actually changing the conceptual diagram. But if there is a feature change that does change, that's when you want to circle back and revisit the threat model. Um, during the threat model conversation, we don't usually go all the way down into the weeds. Usually, we're talking more conceptual, high level. But by having the data flow diagram, they actually know a little bit better what their processes are going to be like. And so we could talk about them when we're addressing the high level stuff. So it's uh, a chance to be more familiar with like, how is that function going to happen? How are we going to authenticate? How are we going to log? What events are we going to log? So those things are already been talked about in the meeting uh, and alongside in their, the developers always have my phone number, so they usually reach out. But that's a good point, yeah. If you're dealing with an external, uh, sorry, the, the question was, is, uh, for every process, do you have to necessarily have it in the threat model or you could go higher up? Um, if there's an external interactor, so you're dealing with someone else's API, you want to make sure that's captured because every time your system talks to someone else's, that you want to make sure it's on the, the, the um, diagram is a external entity. But when you're dealing with the system itself, usually what I tell folks is to aim uh, in the data flow diagram world uh, somewhere between a level zero and a level one, to keep a high enough level to where it's not 5,000 threats, it's usually more like 100 threats that you have to go through. Um, what ends up happening is you could go all the way down into the weeds and talk about each and every function, and you could diagram it, and you could put it into like threat modeling tools, or you could sit down with the matrix and identify all of them, and it becomes bigger than the project itself. And so you end up having to go through a lot more paperwork, a lot more uh, mitigations, and you have to document so much that the, the whole team kind of gets bogged down. But by bringing it back up to like a level zero, level one, right in there, and enough in order to know kind of the main functional areas, like uh, this is our web front end, our web server area, we're going to have our web services here, and then we're going to have our uh, data store in the back, and so you ha understand how the system flows, and then you can talk about how you're going to deal with authentication, with your authorization, with um, something like your logging, with, uh, let's see here, what else, also uh, redundancy. Um, resilient systems like uh, load balancing, different ways of handling the uh, potential denial of service attacks, how those configurations are going to be. So, thanks. Um, if you have your threat model done early enough in your development cycle, wouldn't that just naturally allow for a higher rating in like common criteria? Because like the higher EAL levels say that you've designed security before you've written one bit of code. So if you've got a threat model when you're doing your whiteboarding, you know, wouldn't that then lead to software that could, you know, inherently get higher and higher EAL ratings and that sort of thing? Yes, that's a very good point. Um, so I'm not as familiar with the, the ratings as much, but by having it uh, done, you could actually check that off. You could document it. You could show it in, uh, in an audit or a review. And so that helps when you're dealing with um, trying to show, like, auditors or trying to get ratings on how secure the systems are, yeah. Because going through the steps, being able to show that you've gone through the steps, uh, and especially when it comes to an audit, but most importantly, being able to talk through the with the development team, be able to work with them and on how they need to improve their controls to make the systems more secure. Yeah, it's a team sport. You learn from the developers just as much as they learn from you, and you get a chance to figure out how they approach the different uh, issues. Any more questions? So I have um, some additional resources. Again, the slide deck is already posted on uh, the Tor site. Um, I have a threat modeling tool download, uh, Microsoft's uh, Secure Development Lifecycle resources, and then also um, a book reference. Uh, this is a pretty good book on threat modeling that I found before. So thank you very much for your time, and have a good Tor camp.